click subscribe and click the notification bell if you're a true fan of horror. The work week is approaching, and what could be better to help the long week drag by than true ghost stories? How about 15 of them in one extra long episode? There will be demons, there will be cases of the unexplained, and you will be terrified. Enjoy these 15 allegedly true scary stories of the paranormal. Don't forget, you can share your story at darknessprevails.org. Demon in My Niece's Room by Lacey P. This story is not my own experience, but it's from my eight-year-old niece, Emma. A few days ago, Emma and I were in my room hanging out and talking. I was asking some questions about how school was going and if she still hung out with her certain group of friends. But the topic changed, and somehow she told me that one night she started to hear noises in her room. Now, I've never been the type of person to immediately attribute something to the paranormal, so I began to come up with logical reasons for myself and to make her feel less scared. Maybe it was just some people on the street talking. I explained to her. Her demeanor quickly changed and she shook her head. No, the voice was coming from inside my room. She glared at me, not a hint of playfulness left from our earlier conversation. I sat there for a moment before asking her more questions. Emma continued to tell me that this experience happened between late June to early July of 2018, just a few months back. These were her exact words. It was late at night and I was lying in bed trying to fall asleep when I heard a man start to talk loudly at me. It sounded like he was sitting up against the wall facing my bed. He sounded young, like a 17-year-old boy. He even said my name at one point, telling me to wake up. But I was already awake, wide awake. But I just laid there shaking and covering my face with the blanket. This guy kept telling me jokes, but they weren't funny jokes. They were scary jokes. He told me that I was a bad girl and that I would be burning down there. At this point of the story, Emma's eyes started to tear up and her chin began to shake. It was completely obvious to me that this was not a joke and what had happened truly terrified her. We're Christians and don't believe in ghosts like that but I do believe in pure evil, and the first thing that came to my head was a demon trying to scare or hurt my poor niece. Emma has had a rough past few years and struggles a lot with her self-esteem, even at eight years old, so I thought a demon may have targeted her for those vulnerable reasons, trying to oppress her and tear her down even more. Thinking about it enraged me, it made me hate whatever thing was in her room scaring her. As her aunt, I didn't want to scare her more, so I told her it could have been sleep paralysis, and I explained that it happened to a lot of people, and it was nothing out of the ordinary. This seemed to calm her down a bit and made her feel more at ease. She told me she felt like she was going crazy that day, and when she got the courage to run downstairs to her dad and sleep by him, the voice stopped and she was finally able to go back to sleep. I was the only one in the family she ever told this story to, and when I asked her why she didn't tell her parents, she simply said, I was afraid they wouldn't believe me. Deep down, I don't think it was sleep paralysis. My gut tells me something evil was in that room, and with sleep paralysis, she would not have been able to move, not to mention it lasted quite a while, an hour of this man taunting my niece. We ended the conversation with some prayers, and I said some blessings for her. I even went to her house a few days later to pray and bless her room. She told me nothing has happened again, and I pray that it stays that way. She's far too young to be experiencing that type of horror. Unrested Soul by L. The Raven L. 
It all started around two or three years ago. My family and I had moved to a new small neighborhood in Tucson, Arizona. We leased a new place. It was connected with another house, but thankfully we were divided by a wall. We had at least four dogs during this time, before we ultimately ended up with seven, as we care for dogs a lot, sometimes more than ourselves. Living in this small two-bedroom, one-bathroom house of ours, we didn't have much furniture during the time, as a few months before we moved, my mom was accused of seeing another man, as my stepdad didn't want to see her nor my sister and I, but they seemed to always work things out. It's a bit of a long story. Anyway, during the first few months we lived in that house, I was going through a phase where I constantly watched ghost adventures and always wore black. Looking back on it, I'm not proud, but like I said, it was a phase. Whenever I watched that show, I always got a creepy feeling that someone was watching me somewhere from the corner of the living room, and whenever I looked over, unsurprisingly, I didn't see anything. Just my dogs looking at me as if I was weird. With the year passing and still living at our house, my mother's birthday had just passed a few days back, so she and my stepdad went to an adult art class where they painted and drank. They worked together to paint a cherry blossom tree, which I thought was pretty nice. They hung the piece up at our house, and for some reason when I looked at it, I felt like something bad was going to happen. As I had no reason to feel this way, I put it to the back of my mind and tried to forget about it. Just a few days after my mother's birthday, my grandma would stop by and visit from time to time while I was at school. And during that time as I came back home, my grandma told me that her and my mother both saw a dark, small shadow that was the same height of my cousin who was autistic, disappear into the area where the oven was. This was bizarre, and at first I didn't believe them, but this wasn't the very first time I've dealt with the paranormal before, and apparently before that event, my mom and stepdad had found a broken and shattered Jesus statue of theirs in the backyard, somewhere it shouldn't have been, and when they saw it, my stepdad saw the dark figure of a man running away from the scene. He gave chase, but the moment he rounded the corner of the house, the man was gone, as if he never existed. Now, my mom, doing some research, discovered that a man in his late 20s or early 30s had been shot and passed away in that backyard only five years ago or so. You would think that the people who are letting us rent this home would at least let us know something like that happened before making a deal with us. Hearing about the statue incident, my grandma and I decided to check it out. We picked up the broken pieces and brought it back home to clean and dry it off. Using glue and tape, we put it back together as best we could, and once we were done, we returned it to its normal spot, making sure it was in a good, stable place before we let go of it. But a few days later, yet again, the statue was broken and in the backyard. Someone would have to walk inside, grab the statue, and throw it on the ground outside to do this. So there's no way it simply fell down. Before long, my mother began to act strangely. Her actions, her mood, her personality changed. She began to tell us that she was seeing this black shadow more and more. Once in the corner of her room, and once in the shower, one day, my mother took my sister and I to church, at which my mother began to search for the father of the church, her eyes bursting into tears all of a sudden. My sister and I were both immediately worried about her. The father wasn't there, so we took home a bottle of holy water with us. My sister drove while my mother lay in the back seat, feeling sick and exhausted for some reason. At this point, my mind was reeling, as I knew that this spirit was messing with my mother somehow, but I didn't know how to help, which made me even more upset. Back at home, we were hit by a horrid odor. It was like burnt cigarettes. It made me sick to my stomach. While I was laying down at home, trying to forget the stressful evening, my sister came into the room and told me to hurry to the living room and to bring the holy water. 
I followed her, and I saw my mom in the floor, lying on top of three couch cushions. Her lips were moving, and she was speaking in a language that I didn't know she knew, if it was a language at all. Reaching out to her and calling to her, her eyes opened so quickly, it made my heart seem to stop. Her eyes held this very cold and menacing glare. She stared into my soul. She growled. What? It was in a voice that was unlike her. None of this seemed to stop until we left that place. That shadow. It was certainly something evil, and it tried to hurt my mother or take her away from us. If you're ever looking to buy or rent a home, you might want to do a bit of research on it because the person selling or renting it to you might lie or forget to tell you something important about its history. Strange Experiences by Arya Dini. I've had a small handful of odd events happen to me at my old house. When I was in middle school, my family moved to an old house in a small cul-de-sac neighborhood off of a country road. The previous owners were an old couple. They seemed reserved but kind. The three-level house had the same matted red carpet and white walls in every room on every floor. More than half of the light bulbs didn't work, and there was dust and cobwebs that hadn't seen a spider in ages. The basement didn't even have any working lights, leading my parents to joke about the previous owners being vampires. The place did have a sauna, though, that hadn't been used for a while either. That room smelled of rainwater and damp wood, which, honestly, I found quite soothing. The house had a good few acres of land and woods around it, and our neighbors were quiet and kept to themselves. Even before we moved into that house, I could feel something off about it. I remember riding around town with my mom, house hunting, when we came across the tiny neighborhood. The moment we pulled up to the house, I could feel a vibration coming from it. Not necessarily a bad feeling, just something off as if this empty, neutral house was active in a way. It's hard to describe. I told this to my mother after we moved in, and she had our pastor come by to pray over it, which didn't do anything. It still felt eerie, but not exactly frightening. Nothing big ever happened, just odd things. There were weird noises coming from the attic, which was a small crawl space of a room. They were odd tapping sounds. I got used to the weird things and they stopped bothering me fairly quickly. Sometimes I even found them exciting. Now, after middle school, I got into some trouble and wound up being homeschooled through these Christian packets that I had to do by myself. So I taught and graded myself because both of my parents went to work. As I was home alone during these days, in the middle of the woods with a huge porch and wildlife around me, you can imagine that I spent a lot of time outside, getting stoned, playing guitar, having a good time. But since I was from a strict family, no one else knew that I smoked, so I had to be on the lookout constantly for my parents or sister when they got back. I could hear the garage door opening from the upstairs room in the back. I was a pro at hiding my shenanigans. But one thing that threw me off was the activity in that house, on multiple occasions, you could hear the garage door open, then shut, and you could hear heavy footsteps walk up the steps and into the kitchen, clear as day. Sometimes you'd hear the crinkle of a bag or the jingling of keys, as if someone made it home from shopping. They always went to the kitchen and stopped there. I would stop what I was doing and call out to whoever just came home, when I didn't get a response, I would begrudgingly get up from my comfort and go downstairs. My parents liked to be sneaky even though they weren't good at it. But when I would walk downstairs all the while asking who was home, I'd walk into the kitchen and see no one was home yet. Nobody but me. 
I'd then proceed throughout the entire house, search the garage too, to see if the car was there, but it would be empty. That became a routine, and every time it happened, and it happened often, it never really scared me. I never felt anything menacing about it, though it did get annoying. As I got older, I figured it must have been an imprinted haunting, something that repeats itself over and over. But there was one incident that did frighten me. I was in the kitchen one night, talking to my sister. Behind me were three large windows that looked out into our front yard. It was dark out at the time, but you could still make out the tree in the front yard. There were lights that hung above the windows and shined down on a bed of what should have been flowers, but was only dirt. So you could definitely see if there was someone in the yard outside. Well, at one point in the conversation, we heard a loud, forceful knock, knock, knock on the far left window. My sister and I both turned around as quickly as it happened, but we saw no one, just an empty yard and a swaying tree. We looked at each other and bolted upstairs, laughing and screaming at each other. About a week after that incident, someone tried to break into one of our garages by kicking in one of the panels. What was weird is that when my dad got downstairs into the garage, there was no one there, and where we lived it would have been difficult to get far without being seen, and there was no one around. Of course, they could have ran and hid in the woods, but there was absolutely no evidence of it. No car, no bike, no footprints. The neighbors were old too, so it's not like other kids lived around us. I've never been sure if that had to do with the odd experiences, or if it was someone messing around. The only reason I wonder if they were related to it is because of how closely they happened together. That's where my story ends. My family fell apart, and I soon moved out of that house. I still drive by it every now and then. It was my favorite place growing up, and hopefully the family that occupies it now hasn't had any malevolent experiences. I imagine that they won't. The house never seemed to harness an evil, just normal events that seemed to be imprinted and looped from memory. I think someone who lived there doesn't yet know that they passed on. Invisible Attack by Philosophical Witch It happened one afternoon. I was meditating when I heard the weirdest thing. It sounded like chimes, even though I don't have chimes, and neither do the neighbors, but they were so incredibly clear it was as if they were just beside my head. I tried to focus, but it happened again and again. I looked around and saw nothing. But then I heard a high-pitched squeal, one that quickly raced up to me, and the next thing I know, something hits me upside the head, as if I'd been struck by a giant gong. I was dizzy and disoriented. My head was throbbing and in pain. The chimes rang again, but the second attack was substantially less powerful. When whatever it was hit me again, this time it was more like a dull slap rather than an explosion, but it still hurt and made me wonder what the heck was happening. I started to fall asleep as my eyes grew heavy. It was some sort of deep trance. When I pulled myself out of it, scared, I demanded the entity to leave. It happened so suddenly, it made me feel unsafe in my own home. How do you escape something that you can't see? An Old Friend by Think Before You Hit Me I was 13 when this happened. When I was younger, my mom and dad owned a dog named Sandy. She was a bulldog, and she was very sweet. I grew up with Sandy. I always thought she'd live forever, but she passed away when I was 12. I cried all day when I found out. Now this is where it gets weird. A year after she passed away, I had just turned 13. 
It was also the anniversary of Sandy's passing, and I wanted to visit where she was buried, just to tell her how things were going with me. But a storm was rolling in, and my mom said I had to stay inside. I was bummed out, so I went and played some games in my room for the night. I was the last one up, and it was very quiet, other than my video game's background music. I suddenly heard something strange, the light pitter-patter of claws on hardwood floor. I thought it was my fat cat shadow, but when I looked over at the door, I saw something that made me gasp, a sight that brought tears to my eyes. There in the doorway stood Sandy, exactly how I remembered her. I thought I was seeing things from staying up too late, so I rubbed my eyes, but when I looked back, she was closer. It startled me, honestly. I wasn't sure if it was real. I quickly turned off the game, and when I looked back, she was gone. But I know I had seen her. I went to bed, my mind racing from the experience. And sadly, that was the last I ever saw of Sandy. Shadows of the Past by Silver Wolf 69 Before I begin, I would like to mention that my wife and I never drink, smoke, or use any other substance, so I can't chalk this up to our imagination or hallucinations. A few years after we married, we got a nice little house in a small suburb. We always wanted a three-bedroom, two-bath place and found one for a good price. When we asked why it was so low, the woman selling it to us said she didn't want to be there anymore. We didn't think more of it and began to look inside. It was almost like the place was made for us. We immediately signed the paperwork and scored the house. Even though we were the only potential buyers, it was pretty much a guarantee. I had no idea that it would quickly become clear why the price was so low and why no one else wanted to buy it. A few normal months passed by until one day I was watching ESPN while my wife was making lunch for us. Out of the corner of my eye, I spotted a black shape on the wall. I watched it move upstairs, then I heard a small creaking sound. I never got scared too easily, so I calmly said, uh, honey, you didn't happen to see that, did you? She came in and asked, What are you talking about? I told her about the shadow. She decided to go upstairs and check it out herself. After a few minutes, she came back down and said she didn't see anything. I shook my head and forgot about it. Next week, we were watching SNL. When I happened to look out the window... I saw two dark shapes that were smaller than the first one I'd seen. As I watched, the two began to run in opposite directions. I quickly turned to my wife to tell her about it, but she was already staring out the window as well. She asked me if that's what I had seen that day. I nodded. We weren't exactly scared, maybe a little bit creeped out. On another day, I was connecting my Xbox and after it turned on, I was using some kind of camera feature that detected heat in the area. Using it, I saw a large shape standing next to me, one that was red hot. It was then that I figured something that big and close to me could have hurt me if it wanted. Shaking, I said, Excuse me, I'm doing a live feed with my friends here. Could you please move? The form immediately left, and I only saw myself after that. A month passed by with no further incidents, but the shadows were starting to appear more regularly. I saw them on the garage walls, on the truck, in my room, in the study, in the kitchen, basement, bathroom. One day I got so fed up, I yelled, What's your problem? There was, of course, no response but I did feel a chill. I turned around and saw an especially large shadow. It was eight feet tall, plastered to the wall. I watched it point at the floor, then vanish. I looked where it had pointed, 
and I felt a dire curiosity welling up in me. My wife and I decided to do some digging, and we found out that, like many other haunted places, the house had been built where a family used to live, a family with five kids and a very large black housekeeper named Randall. One night, there was a fire that started in the kitchen and quickly spread through the house. Randall escaped, but all seven of the other family members did not. A few days later, Randall was found lying lifeless on the charred remains of the house with a wound in his head. He had been so distraught, he took his own life. A few months went by until I talked to some construction buddies of mine. When we cleared some ground away outside the house, we found ashes and roofing. I figured that was good enough for me. I'm no archaeologist, but I'm no dummy either. After a few more months had passed from that incident, my wife said she had enough of this house, even though it was a nice place and it had everything we wanted. It clearly wasn't our home. In her eyes, the family that had perished there still owned it and everything around it. We put up with the shadows for another week, packing up and getting ready to move. The house was back on the market soon, and it was quickly bought by another gullible young couple. They moved out as well, after only being there one month. I never did tell them about these shadow people, but I think they got the message. I just drove past the house a few days ago, and it's still empty. I think I know what was going on. The shadow people were the previous family and their housekeeper. They were lost, sad, and confused about what happened to them, and I don't think any of them could bear to leave. We live in a new house now, and I see the occasional tiny shadow out of the corner of my eye from time to time, but nothing nearly as significant as what I saw in that old house. Haunted Doll by Ghost Girl 7 I was 10 years old when my grandpa bought me this doll. It was 30 bucks and it looked like a cowgirl, but it was a big doll, the size of a three-year-old child. My grandpa knew I liked dolls, being an only child myself, but little did I know this doll would put me through hell. One day, an old friend of mine named Katie was staying the night with me. She brought over her doll, and we played with dolls together for a few hours. Then my mom called us down for dinner. We ate quickly so we could hurry back up and play. When we came back, Katie's doll was in my doll's hands in a strangle-like position. We immediately laughed, figuring it was a weird prank from my dad. Later that night, when we were watching movies, Katie turned her head to say something to me. Now, I had placed my doll on my computer chair facing the computer. When she turned her head, she pointed out that the computer had been turned around, and my doll's head was now staring towards us. We both felt a little creeped out, and I threw the doll into the closet. The next day, after Katie left for home, I was in my room watching TV when I heard an animalistic and guttural growling sound and scratching noises coming from the closet like a wild and desperate animal was trapped inside. I froze, paralyzed with fear. What do you do in that kind of situation? At that age, you would instantly think a monster was in your closet. But I gathered up my courage. I ran over to the closet and opened it. I saw the doll. She wasn't lying like I left her, and instead was now somehow propped against the wall directly facing the door, facing me. I grabbed her quickly and opened the attic, throwing her inside. Ever since then, my family and I have been hearing walking sounds and thumps coming from the attic. Not one of my family members will go up there. I don't blame them. That doll is scary, but I have one unanswered question. How can a brand new doll possibly be possessed? I may never know, but that doll is definitely haunted. 
Footsteps on the Ceiling by Dragoness. I have never forgotten this night, nor what I experienced. Because of the night in question, I am careful about messing around with anything that has to do with spirits. The two-story house I lived in was converted into two apartments, and at the time I lived with a boyfriend in the second floor apartment. It was an old house with hardwood floors, old decor, and an attic. The attic had one of those folding stairs that pulled down from a hatch in the ceiling. The attic wasn't much more than crossbeams and old pink insulation packed between. We didn't really use it at all except to show friends our creepy attic space. Once in a while, I would wake up to use the bathroom at night. I'd always been scared of the dark, even now. Once in a while, I get that old creepy feeling. I had to walk past the hallway leading to the kitchen to get to the bathroom, and every time I did, I would get this feeling there was something there. I would convince myself that my imagination was getting the best of me. One night, before that night, I was in the bathroom already when I heard some strange creaking sounds. They seemed to be coming from the hallway beside the bathroom. I instantly stopped breathing and listened intently. Yes, that was a creak on the floorboards for sure. My boyfriend was sleeping in the bedroom, and I felt too silly to call out for him to help, so I built up my courage to make a dash for my room. The moment I stepped out of the bathroom, something roared at me. I screamed, lashing out with my fists at the dark monster that jumped out of the dark, scary hallway and... Ow! My boyfriend exclaimed. Oh my god, are you alright? I asked. It was just my boyfriend spooking me. We both had a laugh as we went back to bed, but as we were laughing off the prank and talking a bit before going back to bed, we heard footsteps coming from above us. We both stopped and listened. After a few seconds, the footsteps stopped, and we agreed it was weird, but probably from the downstairs apartment, not the upstairs attic. But I think we were just in denial. On one occasion, we had some friends over. We were all chatting away when the topic of the paranormal came up. As we were sharing stories, we thought we heard footsteps coming from upstairs. Everyone stopped talking and we clearly heard the footsteps walk across my living room ceiling to the hallway and toward the kitchen. All my friends were excited, and they wanted to go see the attic. So we went to the attic, only to see that it was empty. That event was so creepy that I had trouble sleeping that night. Every week or so, we'd hear those footsteps. They were clearly coming from the ceiling, it was terrifying when I'd hear it. It made me want to move, and I even spent a few days at my friend's house. My boyfriend decided to talk to his mother about the sounds. Mrs. M was a self-proclaimed medium. She wanted to come over to get a feel for the place. I wasn't keen on the idea, but they decided it would be best. Then came the night that I will never forget. Mrs. M had come over and walked around the apartment and the attic to get the feel of the place. She decided a seance would be best. I did not like the idea at all, but I saw no way of getting around it. We all sat on the bedroom floor, among candlelight, as she called out the typical questions. Who are you? What do you want? Mrs. M began to tell us that she felt a very dark presence, when suddenly, a loud glass clinking and smashing came from our kitchen. It was so loud I screamed, and I began to sob. Once it was over, we all got up and walked cautiously to the kitchen to find what had happened. Our bedroom was beside the kitchen, where a wall and pantry were located. We had a collection of glass bottles in the pantry. The floor of the pantry was so full of bottles, the folding door just barely closed. These bottles were all standing and had no room to fall over. But the bottles we found were all toppled over, several of which were broken. The pantry door was partially open, and I stared in horror, exchanging a glance to my boyfriend who knew what I was thinking. Then we all heard the footsteps on the ceiling walking down the hallway from the kitchen to the attic stairs. 
Panicking, I grabbed my purse and jacket and went to Mrs. M's car outside. I felt like I was being watched the entire time. I tried my best to explain away what had happened in the apartment, but nothing I came up with convinced me. A week later, we moved away. These days, I actively ignore anything paranormal and refuse to have even a Ouija board in my home. I believe that there is an invisible world around us and that we need to stay far away from it. Fresh Cookies in Eureka Springs, submitted by Chili Willie. When my parents got married in the mid 80s, they didn't have much money, so their honeymoon was comprised of a cheap road trip filled with sightseeing and packed lunches. One place they came to was Eureka Springs, Arkansas. They fell in love with this cute historical town. They enjoyed it so much that they would take their two children back there years later for a small family vacation. I was around 11 or 12 years old and my sister was 14. This would have been around the year 2000. This was a slightly different family vacation than previous ones because my sister and I were going to get our own room at the hotel which meant we wouldn't have to be annoyed by our parents or be kept up at all hours of the night with their loud snoring. The hotel was very Victorian in style and furnishings. The old wooden floors creaked under your steps, and I just remember thinking it was like stepping back in time or being in an old movie. So we checked in and realized my parents' room is not directly next to our room, as everyone had assumed, but instead, it would be up the flight of stairs and a ways down the hall. We all figured it wasn't a big deal, and so gathered our luggage and got situated. I will admit, though, that when my sister and I got to our room, we laughed about how eerie the place was. We got excited to see the door leading out to a balcony. However, once we opened it, we realized this was not a good thing. The balcony was joined with the room next door, which to us at that age seemed a little creepy. After an afternoon of sightseeing and going out to dinner, we headed back to the hotel and retired to our separate rooms. We showered and crawled into bed, where I joked and talked with my sister for a while. It was pretty late at this point, and though I don't remember the time exactly, I would say it was between 11 and 12. We were getting tired and started trailing off, when there was a faint and gentle knock on the door. I looked at my sister, confused. Then we quickly realized it must have been either mom or dad. Groggily, I got up and checked the peephole. On the other side of the door, I saw an old woman with white hair. I relayed the information back to my sister in a whisper when there was another knock at the door. My sister ran over to take a peek and kind of had a goofy look on her face and shrugged her shoulders. Then she called out, Yes? In a tender, crackled voice, we heard something about cookies. My sister decided to open the door. Standing there was a woman in a very old, outdated maid uniform. But that was the style of the hotel, and I was pretty sure that all the workers there were wearing that old style clothing as well. She was holding a large round tray filled with cookies. The woman repeated herself. I have some fresh baked cookies if you'd like one, followed by a friendly smile. We told the woman no thank you, then shut the door and went back to bed. We didn't think much of it, other than to basically agree it was weird. Then we went to sleep. In the middle of the night, I woke up to the bathroom light flickering on and off. Not fast and continuous, but just a tiny flicker every minute or so. I remember waking up a few times to look out toward the windows to the balcony, waiting to see a silhouette standing there. Several times in the night, I had a very strange feeling of being watched. To say the least, I did not like it at all and did not sleep well. In the morning, my sister told me that she woke up in the night to see the bathroom door slowly close on its own. She hadn't noticed any flickering, though. I honestly thought she had just been freaked out by the woman and that her mind was playing tricks on her. 
Whereas what I thought I saw was just an electrical issue and not a big deal. Once my parents came down to our room to get us for breakfast, we casually asked them if they enjoyed their cookies last night. They had no idea what we were talking about. We explained to them what happened with the old lady, and they said that no one had come by their room. We headed downstairs toward the lobby, and on the way some flyers in the wall caught our eyes. It was promotional material for ghostly tours. At the front desk, my dad asked about the cookies last night and joked that he wasn't offered any. The concierge gave us a weird look and informed us that taking baked cookies to the rooms at night is not something the hotel does or offers or has ever done. We all thought this was very strange. Once we got back home, we looked up the Crescent Hotel we had stayed at to find out it is basically the most haunted hotel in America. Now, normally I'm skeptical to things like this, but I distinctly remember that none of us had any clue about the hotel being haunted beforehand, so there were no preconceived notions of ghosts or the paranormal. And I've always wondered, what would have happened if we'd taken a cookie? Ghost at the Alamo by Some Drummer Boy. It was about 10 years ago when I was a freshman in high school. It was about a week before Halloween when my dad surprised me and my brothers with a ghost tour. At this point in my life, I was intrigued with the paranormal. However, I was highly skeptical of it, but I was about to get a formal introduction in this field. Nightfall came, and we met up with a group of people who were going to take the tour with us. The tour started at the Alamo Cenotaph Monument, which sits majestically, Texan pride, sorry, about 200 feet from the main entrance from the Alamo. We were greeted by the tour guide who was dressed up like Indiana Jones. Then we began to walk westward, away from the Alamo. Something struck me as odd about this guide. Why would he need an overly large backpack and a foldable chair for a short tour? Well, fast forward to the end of the tour. We stop at the long barracks near the entrance, and the guide pulls out a tripod from what I thought was a foldable chair case. From his backpack, he takes out a thermal camera and proceeds to tell us about a ghost that roams those barracks. He points the camera down the breezeway and tells us that if you call the ghost by name, he'll manifest himself but more often reveals himself to the call of a woman. I forgot the name of the ghost, but for the sake of the story, let's call him Johnny. A woman volunteered to call for Johnny. She called his name three times, all the while I'm looking at the camera screen pointed at the wall. What I saw fascinated me about the paranormal and had me believing that maybe, just possibly, something about it is real. From around the corner, I saw a green figure slowly come into view from the blue background. I looked up from the screen to see that there was no one in the breezeway, but looking back at the screen, the figure was still there. I told my brother to walk in front of the camera to make sure that it wasn't just a recording of someone else, but he popped up as red-white on the screen. When he walked back, the figure slowly retreated back around the corner. This was the first time I could firmly say that I saw a ghost with my own eyes, so to speak, but I still remain skeptical to other people's stories. I'm not saying I don't believe them, I just want to experience it myself. The Veil by TR06 Crow This happened on a night a couple of years ago in a room that has made me no stranger to paranormal happenings. A little backstory to myself. I'm now 22 years old, living in Central Texas with my parents. I'm a loser, I know. Get it out of your system. We've lived here for 13 years, as of New Year's 2018. Since living here, I've had multiple happenings that are paranormal, ranging from nightmares to real-life hauntings. I'm going to share one with you that has stuck out to me as straight up disturbing. It was the beginning of fall 2016, and I had gone to bed at around 10.30 p.m. 
I suddenly woke up at around 2.12. Everything was oddly silent around me. My fan was on high because it was still rather warm out, and yet I didn't hear or feel anything from the fan. The only thing I heard was a strange sound made by something moving on the hardwood floor. And this is where it gets strange. There were six pennies rolling in a perfect circle on the floor next to my bed. I looked over to the corner furthest from my bed where my TV was, and I saw this veil. It was a black mass about seven feet high and was about three feet bottom to top. It was solid yet transparent, like it wasn't completely there. Somehow, I suppose, I convinced myself it was part of a dream, one that I had just woke up from, so I turned around and went back to sleep. But I woke up once more at 2.23 to notice the coins were now flat on the floor against the far wall. The veil had disappeared, and I felt the fan blowing once again. I rolled over to face the wall, thinking I was right about it being a dream, and I felt this presence behind me, like it was right on the edge of my bed. I didn't dare look. I simply hoped it was me being paranoid, and I closed my eyes. At 2.35, I woke up yet again. This time, I was sure that what was happening was not just a dream. I slowly looked over the room. The pennies were now rolling from one end of the room to the other and back again, and the veil had made it to the end of my bed, and I realized that I heard nothing again, not even the pennies. I felt true fear at this point, almost paralyzing. The air was so thick, it felt like breathing through a straw. I do not know what happened after I slowly laid back down, but I don't remember closing my eyes. At 2.47, I was awake again, wondering what was going on with me. I pinched myself and felt pain, so I suppose I was awake. But I felt the same as the other times I woke up. I sat up and took a deep breath, but felt like I had taken a quick breath, so I was entirely unsatisfied. This veil had now moved closer to the head of my bed, but was still a few feet away. I felt the thing staring into me. It wasn't a feeling of being watched, it was more a feeling of being prey to a starved predator, and I was cornered. It stopped moving, and the veil had become more solid, and now went all the way to the floor. I was staring straight ahead toward my window out of fear of looking this thing in the face. Suddenly, the room became so silent, my ears rang louder than I've ever heard them do before. This thing faded away into the corner where the floor meets the wall. I laid down after it was gone, nearly crying from fear at this point. It took an hour or two to fall asleep, but somehow, I did. I woke up at 7.15, lying near motionless for 20 minutes, wondering if I was awake or if I dreamt the entire night. I asked myself if I was awake now, I asked what was going to happen next. At 8 a.m., I was positive I was awake. I know this wasn't sleep paralysis, as I could move my body and appendages. I have had other things happen in that room as well. So as my mother, who had someone whisper to her on about three or four occasions as she now sleeps there, if anyone knows what may have happened or had similar occurrences, I would love to hear about it and it might be a little comforting to know that I'm not the only one. The Haunted House by Perez26775 This story is from my aunt. Even to this day, my aunt still lives in the house where many people have experienced their nightmares. When she first moved in there, she had a sensation that something was wrong with the place. The first event she experienced happened one night when she was praying, and as soon as she finished, she felt someone or something choking her. At the same time, a pen flew across the room. When it let go, she panicked, but there wasn't much she could do but pray again. That was the only place they had to go. On another occasion, when my uncle stayed the night, 
He was trying to sleep when out of nowhere he was being wrapped around with a blanket and could hardly breathe. He stayed for one more night, but that night he was trying to sleep when he heard someone trying to look for something in the dark. He told whatever it was to just turn on the light. When he heard nothing but silence, he thought it was so strange. He turned the light on, but saw nothing at all. The most terrifying experience, though, was when the witch came. A strange and spiteful old woman gave a rather suspicious gift of some plain boots, which my aunt did not accept because the witch admitted that the boots were cursed to break her legs. The same old woman witch came one night, on the darkest night of all. My aunt saw her peering through their windows. She saw how the witch stomped her feet, and she could hear her stomping on the roof as well. She was mostly scared from the fact that an old woman like that made it up to the roof. Then there came the scratches on the walls, scratch marks that formed right in front of her but seemed to come from nowhere. Many neighbors warned my aunt that there was evil within that house, but that was her home and she had to deal with it. They told her to find the source, which they say is a skull buried in the ground around the house. She's tried finding it, but her search has not been fruitful. She's gotten used to the evil within that house by now, but it keeps creeping the soul out of their visitors every time. Why I'll Never Touch a Ouija Board Again by Bull Mackay. I've only used a Ouija board twice in my life, the first time being an absolute fluke, making me a non-believer for a while, but the second time being the reason for this story and making me a true believer. So a group of friends and I decided to bust out the Ouija board, mostly as a joke. There were four of us sitting around in the basement. Mind you, this isn't a creepy basement. It is a finished one without any windows, so it was quite dark. However, if there was a creepy part at all, it was the part where the laundry room was. Thankfully, there was a door separating the two spaces. After shutting the lights off and placing the board in the middle of the room, we began our session. As all these stories seemed to go, nothing happened at first. We sat in silence, staring at the board and waiting in anticipation. Finally, the planchette started to move. At first, all I can think about is who's doing this, because I wasn't doing anything. I took my hands off of it and looked at my friends calling someone on their bullcrap. My three friends looked at me in absolute shock, questioning me now. We placed all our hands back on the planchette and asked one of the most basic questions. If someone is here right now, do something. We waited again while the board spat gibberish back at us, realizing it later on it was probably a foreign language being spoken at the time. After sitting for about 20 minutes, growing anxious and nervous, something else finally happened. I mentioned earlier the door to the creepy dungeon laundry room was completely shut. Well, the door flew open and smashed right against the wall. All four of us jumped up and bolted to the stairs, tripping over each other to get to the top. We left the board open to whatever we had summoned. Now we were all outside feeling somewhat safe, and we did not want to get back in that house for a while. Fast forward a few hours, we've all calmed down a little bit, laughing about the situation and trying to rationalize it. We eventually walked back into the basement to find the laundry room door still wide open and something much worse. The entire room had been torn apart. The TV was pushed down into the floor. The computer screen had a massive crack through the middle. The mattress was across the room and upside down. I'm sure you get the picture. The four of us stood even more shocked and horrified than before. Again, we ran away, now tripping over each other and fighting to be the first out. I went home that night terrified to even close my eyes in fear of what we had unleashed into our lives. You might think someone had come into the house, but there's no way that could have happened. We had locked the door before leaving, and my friend's parents hadn't come home yet, and the only part that was destroyed was that basement. You would think if the house was broken into, it wouldn't be focused all in the basement, 
the room where we made the bad decision of opening the Ouija board. The following final two stories I've read before, but they're scary enough that I really wanted to bring them back, so I hope you enjoy them. The Portal Behind the Mirror by Lucia P. It all began back in May 2012. My sister and her fiancé were staying in my parents' house because she had recently been in a severe accident and couldn't afford medical bills as well as rent. We didn't have much money either, but we did and still do live in a large four-bedroom house so having them stay with us wasn't an issue. I was a lonely 13-year-old girl at the time. I'd been homeschooled all my life, so even though it was the start of the summer, I didn't have any plans or friends to hang out with. I spent most of the time in my bedroom with the curtains drawn, playing music and reading paranormal stories online. I'm not afraid to admit I was depressed, desperate for someone to spend my time with, to be honest, for a time there, I looked into satanic spells and things like that. I performed a lot of different rituals, read a lot of spells out loud, prayed to different entities that weren't good. But after a time, I stopped, as it seemed silly to me. I realized it was all ridiculous at a certain point. A week or so after finally stopping all of that satanic stuff, I was sitting in bed and reading. I remember this night very vividly because it is by far the scariest thing I've ever experienced. My parents were downstairs along with the rest of my family, watching Sherlock Holmes. It wasn't them pranking me. I knew that as much as I wish it were. Anyway, I was playing Pink songs softly in the background when I noticed a low scraping noise I thought it was something wrong with the recording, so I paused the song. However, the scraping continued. Scrape, scrape, scrape. By then, I realized where the sound was coming from. The large mirror-doored closet that took up the entire far wall of my room. Whiskey? I called, thinking my cat must have crawled inside the closet and got stuck. My cat is very vocal, though so when I didn't hear any response to me calling, I stood up and approached the door. I slowly opened it, and the noise halted immediately. I checked behind the hanging clothes and everywhere that my cat could have possibly been, but I found nothing. That was when I realized that when I'd moved the clothes to the side, they had made the same scraping noise I'd heard before because the hangers hung on a metal bar. That realization made me shut the door and hop back into bed. Did I imagine it? I told myself I must have, so I simply turned up the music and continued reading. But moments later, scrape, scrape, scrape. I kid you not, I felt every hair in my body stand up. What the heck was in my closet? I revved up the volume on my songs in an attempt to drown it out, but the louder I made the music, the louder it got to combat the noise. I turned the page that I'd been on in my book, then I paused the music and simply listened. Sure enough, the scraping stopped for a moment. I thought, oh, thank God, it's over. But I thought too soon, because within seconds, I could hear a slight clink clinking like metal bumping against metal, followed by dragging sounds, like long clothes trailing on carpet. The noise moved out of my closed cupboard door, past the end of my bed, and over to my younger sister's bed, where it seemed to either stand or sit, because the noise stopped. All I could do was sit there like a deer in headlights, staring at the empty spot on the bed across from me. I saw nothing, but I could very audibly hear breathing. You know that feeling you get when you can tell someone is staring at you? It was like that, but worse, because I couldn't see what was doing it. 
I remember trying to call out to someone, anyone, hoping that my mom had come upstairs and would enter my room, but no sound escaped my lips, just a pitiful croak and terrified tears that streamed down my face. I, I couldn't move. I eyed the door to the hallway, then back to the empty bed. I felt the tension in the air break, and I darted for the handle, and I made it out. I bounded down the stairs like my life depended on it. Who knows, it probably did. I sat behind the sofa as everyone continued to watch TV. They didn't notice me, shaking, teary-eyed behind them. But at least I was no longer alone. A couple hours passed with me just sitting there before my mom told me it was getting late and that I looked like I needed some sleep but I was not going back up there alone, so I asked my sister to come up with me. She sat on her bed and I explained what had happened. I couldn't tell if she believed me, but I was visibly shaken, so she offered to leave her nightlight on. I slept well, surprisingly. No scraping noises, nothing. A couple of days passed, and I was spending less and less time alone in my room. I did not want whatever was there to come back. Then one morning, I opened my eyes just as the sun was rising. I looked around my room, noticing the first few rays of light streaking in from behind the sea blue blinds. An immense weight was pressing down on my chest, so I looked down. There was a strange face not more than six inches from mine. It was paler than my bedsheets with human-like features narrow lips and nose, but the lips were icy blue and the pupils were barely visible, just tiny gray slits. I could see what looked like stitches all along the outside of its face and the beginnings of black hair, but no body, like it had stuck its face through a portal to watch me sleep, but I could still feel its body weight. All I remember is staring at it, and then feeling incredibly drowsy and falling back to sleep. I've spoken with several people about this, and they told me it sounded like sleep paralysis. However, I could move my head, so I don't think it was that. Things happened quite frequently after that. Light switches turning on. The music box in the fireplace even wound itself up once one day, while I was in the living room. I actually started to think that maybe it was a friendly spirit, because it didn't do me any harm. It simply followed me. But I was definitely wrong. Things took a turn for the worse one night, when I had woken up from a vivid nightmare, in which a pale, bald creature with deep black pits for eyes rose out of a lake of black water and slowly walked toward me. I remember jolting up and asking my sister if she was willing to put her bed next to mine, just to make me feel better. However, she kept complaining that her bed kept getting tugged away from mine during the night. Things got worse and worse. My sister would complain that she would feel hands around her neck when she tried to sleep, or feel eyes watching her. I thought it must have been my fault, so I moved into the spare bedroom. The first night I stayed in the separate room, I heard my sister calling my name from the other room. I went to see what was wrong, and I found her bawling her eyes out. She told me she had just turned off her light to go to bed, when she heard someone tapping on the window from the outside. I went to check behind the curtains, and saw nothing except the pitch black dark outside. Bear in mind the room is on the second floor, so the window was about 15 feet from the ground. I didn't know what to do, so I offered her to stay in my new room with me. I started having vivid nightmares every night. In all of them, I would see this tall, dark figure with a long black trench coat and long, dark hair. It would tell me detailed stories about things it had seen. I actually started to look forward to these encounters. I would call it... I would call it Allie, short for Alistair. It was a name I'd never heard before, which only made things stranger. I ended up talking to my parents about things that were happening, which I soon regretted, 
because it made Alistair angry. The dreams changed. I would get touched forcefully, and even sometimes during the day, I'd feel things moving around under my clothes. I ended up moving rooms again, and everything was back to normal for a couple of weeks. But one night, I woke up to pressure on my lower body, and looked up to see the silhouette of a bony, bald, humanoid thing on top of me. The next morning, I went immediately to tell my mother. I couldn't hold it in, I broke down in front of her, which was very unlike me. Thankfully, she took it seriously. She had a group of spirit healer friends, and they prayed over me every day for a week. And luckily, I think it worked. Things got better. I'm so glad I wasn't stuck in that horrible loop, being haunted every night. All I can say is, don't laugh off everything you read. Sometimes there's more than what meets the eye. Little Impersonator by Cassie Bella I still don't understand what happened that day. We've moved from that house since, and it's been a long time, but I remember it like it was yesterday. I remember I could not sleep that night. I was just a 14-year-old girl. Now, I don't get scared much anymore, and I love anything scary or horror-related. But when I was little, I was scared of almost everything. Any little bump at night and I would start crying, but this experience was much different. Back then, I was still terrified of the dark, and I would sleep with my TV on. My old house was very small as well, and only had three rooms, one for me, my sister, and my parents. I was having trouble sleeping that night. My baby sister cried every few minutes. She was only four, and she got scared way easier than me. Unfortunately, this was around the time my parents decided to ignore her crying, to try to get her to be more independent but I was starting to get annoyed, so I took her into my room to let her sleep with me. I had a bunk bed after all, so it was fine. We said our goodnights to each other and fell asleep. Well, my sister did. I stayed awake, and I watched the TV that lit up my room. That's when I noticed something. The closet door was open. I had been playing with my cousin Lily that morning before we went to school. We always played before school like that. The thing is, we always close the door. We double check that we close it before leaving the school. That's because there's a large doll in the closet that we sometimes play with, but we always pretended it was haunted. Deep down, I believed it, and it scared me. So I simply closed that door so I didn't have to look at it. I got out of bed and slowly crept toward the closet. I got up close to the door. I quickly turned the light on and I peeked inside. It was a relief. The doll was still in its place, but something was off. My clothes were messed up. Oddly enough, my shirts had been taken off the hanger, turned inside out, and then hung back up. And my pants were the same, but they had been placed back in the drawer. Besides that, everything else was in place. Considering my overly organized mom was the one who hung my clothes and folded them, there was no way this was her mistake and had hung up my clothes inside out. Feeling odd, but not entirely creeped out, I slowly turned off the light and closed the doors to the closet. Then I crawled back into bed. I wasn't really that scared, just confused. How did someone do that without making any noise? Or who had come into my room and I didn't notice it? just to pull a weird prank like that. I laid in my bed and I continued to watch the TV when my mother suddenly walked in. Hey, did you come into our room? She asked. I shook my head and I told her that I had been in my room the entire time. Well, we heard someone come in and we already asked your sister if it was her, she said. What? I was confused even more now. My sister had been in my room the whole time, and neither of us had left. My sister was still below me in the bunk bed. My mother didn't seem to notice this, then left the room after I answered her. She had told me to go to sleep. 
But after hearing this and the situation getting more confusing and suspicious, there was no way I could sleep. How in the world did someone go in my parents' room when my sister and I had been here the whole time? For about a week after that, I had a lot of trouble sleeping. Every little noise made me jump. Better yet, every morning when I'd get dressed for school, my clothes were always inside out. For an entire week, I would have to realign my clothes before leaving for school, something that took quite a long time. But then the next morning, they would all be inside out again without any explanation. My little sister believed my story as it was happening to her too. Her clothes would have been tampered with when she went back to her room to get dressed. For someone so young, she was pretty smart, observant of her surroundings more so than the average girl her age. One day, she was in her room playing with little pony dolls and Barbie dolls. I was hanging with Lily and my parents were outside. She told me she left her room for a snack and when she went back, all the heads and hands had been pulled or cut off of her dolls. I believed her because when I got back home, I saw it for myself. She couldn't have done it herself because she was much too short to reach the drawer with the scissors in them and she would never break one of her own toys. My parents would have gone crazy. More strange things continued to happen throughout the next few months and after a couple of years, we decided to move. With my dad having family in California and since he was able to get citizenship in America, we ended up moving there from Mexico. A few years after we moved, my mother told me a story that frightened me. She said that she had gotten up one morning when we were still in Mexico. She said that she had gotten up one morning on a Saturday. At the time, I was staying over at a friend's house and my sister was sleeping in my mom's bedroom. My mother had gotten up to get a drink from the kitchen when she suddenly heard my sister calling her, but it was coming from my little sister's bedroom. My mother wasn't thinking straight and walked right into my sister's room, forgetting that she wasn't even in that room. My mother looked around, not seeing my sister in that room, but being tired and groggy so early in the morning, she was convinced that my sister was somewhere in there. Suddenly, she heard my little sister's voice calling again, this time from her closet. She was about to go to the closet when she suddenly heard my sister yelling from her bedroom, my mother's bedroom. She had had a nightmare and was scared when she saw her mother wasn't there. The closet door that my mother was almost at had been opened a little bit. So when she had stopped and listened to my actual little sister getting out of bed, the closet door suddenly slammed shut. Freaking out, my mother grabbed my sister and left the house until she had to pick me up. She then told my dad that night, but he didn't believe her. They suggested that they move a few months after. And as I said, we're now in California and I'm so glad we're here. I still think about it sometimes, wondering what would have happened if my sister never cried out for my mom and if my mom had, in fact, opened the closet door. Well then, that episode was a doozy. If you can't tell, I recorded that all in one long sitting. Ugh, now my butt and my throat need a good rest, so I'm going to get on out of here, but I hope you guys enjoyed and I hope you have a page marked in your phone book with the listing for The Exorcists. Good night. Be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. Don't forget, you can send me your stories at darknessprevails.org. If you want to support my channel further, donate any amount at patreon.com slash darknessprevails. For as long as you do donate, you'll get exclusive access to ad-free mp3 downloads of each episode and you'll get your name in the credits at the end of the videos. You can also click the shop button below or go to teespring.com slash stores slash darkness prevails to check out my creepy and cool merchandise. Thank you. Now, here are my five favorite early comments from the previous full episode about five random scary stories. X Fresh Kate says, yo, this seems like it's gonna be a really interesting topic and who better to narrate it than darkness. Edit. Please do more of these, yeah? 
Now, you wouldn't be saying I'm the best to narrate this if I had Morgan Freeman, the man himself, guest starring, but I don't think my underwear is thick enough to handle that. Anissa Khan says, your videos help me sleep at night, so thank you. You're welcome. Sleep is like the best thing after food and water, so I'm glad it can help you achieve it. Anime Dark Angel 66 says, I got salt, some iron, and spray paint, ready and armed for some spooky stories read by the master. And hey, with that spray paint, you can graffiti up a subscribe button on those monsters and tell them to smash it for old darkness. Leonard Phillips says, quick question, do you ever plan on doing creepy stories from Rhode Island? Heck yeah. It might take me a while to do dedicated videos for each state, because of course, some states are more popular and searched more often than others. But I will definitely read stories from any state, any country, anywhere. Jason Stott says, another episode of Darkness Prevails to keep me sane during a boring football game. Hmm, I'm not sure if Jason's with me on thinking football is boring, which I can say because I used to play football, or if that particular game was bad. Either way, I'm glad I could help, Jason. And Alexander Apocalypse says, this will defeat Thanos. Ugh, I don't feel so good. Anyways, guys, this brings us to the end of another episode. Thanks so much for tuning in again. Until next time, here are the credits to my patrons who continue to donate because they're awesome people. Remember, stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange